all being here. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing our opening chorus. We've got a solo a cappella, so if anyone can help me sing out. Let's all stand together. Song 761, Therefore the Redeemed. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. Great singing. You may be seated. That's not bad. It only took through the whole first time through it to get everyone's attention. That's, that's pretty good. That's a healthy church. Don't listen to the first song because you're fellowshipping. I'm for it. It was good. Nothing excites me more than to look out and see everybody talking to each other and catching up with what's going on in their lives. And, and God's good. God's gracious. And he's a, he's a kind and giving God, isn't he? All righty. Well, we uh, open in prayer and then we have our verses that we'll go over. We just have this week to get them down into our hearts. And then we'll move on to two more. And can you believe we're almost through the year? A lot happening in August and September here at Faithway Baptist Church. But let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for Jesus Christ. Uh, that's the whole purpose of us gathering together is to hear from you. And so we're glad that we can. We're glad that the scriptures are clear. We're glad that the scriptures are plain. They're, they're, uh, they're able to understand. Even a child can understand his need for salvation at a very young age. And so, Father, help us that make life more complicated than it should be, that we would see the simplicity of you and the grace and the kindness and the goodness and the ability not only to be saved and to know you as Lord and Savior, but also to live for you. Thank you for that joy that we can experience in you. Help that to be the case today as we fellowship. What a joy it is to be around your people and to see the, the bubbliness and the joy and, 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 and life and the circumstances and the difficulties that are all wrapped up in it. We're so glad that you are in control and that all things are not falling apart, but they're falling into place. And we're glad that they are. Now bless and encourage us. Give us a sweet time of fellowship together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Alrighty, so we have our verses up here, and we're memorizing uh, two verses a month, or that's the goal, and then by the end of the year, you can have those into your heart, because then the Holy Spirit can use them uh, to guide you, correct you, change you, maybe use it in counseling with somebody else as well. All right, here we go, we're going to say the, um, the reference verse. Colossians 1.28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, Colossians 1.28. I've been looking at Tim, and I can tell he's got his eyes closed because he's trying to do it without, and then I see him open up. <laughs> I keep mine open the whole time. <laughs> I am not there yet. Here we go. Ready? Philippians 3.12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if there I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. It's Thank you for ending that up. All right, well, we're glad you're here, and we're excited about next week as Neighborhood Bible Time will come to our church, and we're going to be able to reach out into our community to reach children and teenagers. How exciting is that, that we have that opportunity 
to make a difference. So, Mr. Tim, you come. Well, the moment that we accepted Christ as our Savior, we became born again and we received eternal or everlasting life. We understand that there will be a moment, uh, if, if the Lord tarries, that we will die and spend eternity with God forever in heaven. And that is encouraging, to know that we will spend eternity forever in heaven with our Savior, with our God. I don't know if you've been discouraged or if things have been going on, but let me tell you, it is encouraging to know that we will spend eternity with God forever in heaven. Let's stand together and sing When We All Get to Heaven, song 103 in the wilds, When We All Get to Heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. On the last, onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Great singing. Let's continue in the celebration hymnal, song number 294, One Day. I am so thankful that we get to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for who he is and for what he's done for us. The words of this song are so powerful. As we sing them out, it goes a little fast, but think about the words as we sing them to Jesus this morning. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as can be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. One day they led him up Calvary's mountain. One day he nailed him to die on a tree. Suffering anguish, despised and rejected. Bearing our sins, my Redeemer is he. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. On the fourth, one day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. 
Then he arose over death he had conquered. Now is ascended, my Lord, evermore. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. On the last, let me hear you sing it. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one's bringing. Glorious Savior, this Jesus is mine. Living he loved me, dying he saved me. Buried he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious day. Great singing, you may be seated. Well, you're singing well for no piano today, and uh, the host will be moving uh, locally, but they are pulling that all together, and we're glad they were able to find a place. Thank you for those of you that were praying uh, for them as they were uh, looking for um, that place where they could uh, rent and uh, move into. I just want to remind you that um, I'm noticing as we leave on both doors is uh, take five and uh, give five. And uh, we're not really taking them anymore. We did the first week. But take five of these, and uh, not to see how many you can get at home, but to pass them out. So take five and take them to the store with you. Uh, pass them out to your neighbors or whatever that is, just so people can know that Faithway Baptist Church is here in the community. And on the back is the gospel, so that it can know in our service times. And so if they're looking for a church or they have questions, uh, we can answer it. So on your way out, just grab five, take them with you, and... Uh, put them in your car, and when you go into the store, hand them out or wherever that might be. All righty. And then uh, MBT is about to descend on us. Uh, Trent Reynolds and Isaiah Jones will be our two young men that are uh, arriving on Saturday, and they'll help us finish up at Coon Creek. And then on Sunday night starts the teen uh, rally in uh, Siler Park at uh, 6 o'clock at night. And so we're hoping for a good amount of teens. So be out visiting, be out passing out brochures. You can get them from Tim before you leave today. It has all the information on it that they need to know to uh, be part of the event. And we're looking forward to a great week with the teenagers. Then on Monday morning at 9.30 a.m., we'll be gathering the younger kids, first grade through sixth grade, here at the building where we will have the rally. And so if you'd like to help, just sign up on the sheets that we'll have out here after service. Uh, if you want to uh, help serve uh, refreshments, you want to help register to kids, whatever that is that you, you feel you could help with, we'd love to have you. We'll put you to work. And you say, I can only come for one day. Well, then come that one day. If you can come for all five days, come for all five days. But we want to reach our community, and this is one way that we can. It'll be a busy week. Make no doubt about it. Some things will suffer at home that normally don't because you'll be out of the home more often than usual. But it will be a time for us to really invest in others. You say, you know, I can't make it. My schedule, my work, my responsibilities uh, do not afford or allow me to come. Uh, you can donate cookies. We need cookies. Uh, there's a list out here of items that we need for the teenagers and items that we need for the children. And so if you can bring those by, we would be very um, happy to receive those and use them uh, for the rally. Now, Coon Creek um, uh, begins on Thursday night or Thursday late afternoon, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We also have a sign-up sheet if you'd like to come by the booth that we have 
where we'll be making balloon animals and meeting families and trying to talk to them about Neighborhood Bible Time, VBS, and get them to sign up and commit to bring their children. We usually uh, make around 350, 400 balloon animals for children and teenagers, and it's an opportunity for us to explain what's going on here at Faithway. So you say, well, I can't make balloon animals. That's fine. Can you come and hand out um, literature and just say, hey, our VBS is next week. Would you like to sign up? We'd love to have you come. Here are the hours. And you can come for an hour, great. Come for a half hour, great. Come for a couple hours, fantastic. Come one day, great. Come all the days, that will work as well. Just uh, let us know by signing up on the sheet for us. Um, pray for MBT. Pray that God will, will move in the hearts of those that hear the gospel uh, to either grow closer to him or maybe their need is uh, to be saved. And then uh, next week, uh, we have the parade on Sunday. So that alters our schedule here at Faithway Baptist Church because the parade comes right down Washington. Um, and so they close down this street at a certain time. So next week, there will be no Sunday school. And we will have our service at 9.30 a.m. And that way we can end and uh, get the... Uh, uh, our float ready, get it all organized. Tim and a group of men are putting that together. We have Bob Throw here today. He's going to be driving the tractor and uh, does every year for us. And we're going to drive through the streets and promote our Team Olympic thing for VBS and pass out literature. We normally get around 1,000 brochures passed out. So if you would like to walk alongside or behind the float to hand out water bottles to people, which they really enjoy, also pass out literature, sign up, and if you're going to be here, we'll, we'll have a lunch meet so you can make a sandwich before you go out and walk. But I need to know that you're going to be here so I can buy the right amount of food needed uh, for those that are going to be walking in the parade. The rest of you, you're welcome. We have uh, best seating arrangements ever. Right out in front, we'll put chairs out there first thing in the morning and save that area, and you'll be able to um, sit out in front and watch the parade as it comes by and cheer for the uh, Faithway float as it comes by. If you have any other questions, uh, just call me, ask me, say, hey, I can help, but what would you want me to do? I can walk, walk, through, walk that through with you. And then here's a date. It's in the future, but you might want to go ahead and put it on your calendar. And I'll give you more details as we hit August. But our church picnic will be September 12th. That's a Sunday. We'll actually have the service in the park. And uh, we'll bring food and we'll cook on the grill. And uh, we'll have a wonderful time uh, together. That's on September 12th. September 12th. You might want to write that uh, date down. A lot of announcements. So we'll end there. And Mr. Tim, you come. Well, let's all stand together. We're going to sing song 776 in the celebration hymnal, Sweet Beulah Land. Let's all stand together, all three verses, Sweet Beulah Land. I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before no sad goodbyes will there be spoken for time won't matter anymore Beulah land I'm longing for you and someday on thee I'll stand where my home shall be eternal. Beulah land, sweet Beulah land, I'm looking Looking now across the river where my faith will end in sight, there's just a few more days.
days to labor, then I will take my heavenly flight. Beulah land, I am longing for you, and someday stand where my home shall be eternal Beulah land sweet Beulah land on the last I see the lines I hear the singing a brand new song of joy divine my soul rejoices just in knowing that soon these pleasures will be mine. Beulah land, I am longing for you. And someday on the I'll stand where my home shall be eternal. Great seeing you. you. May be seated. All right, the children can go with Mr. Tim unless they're already back that way. We're so glad for that um, that hymn. I think that when I hear you sing it, you sing it with an eye beyond here, and only a believer can have an eye beyond here. And we're all going to be there together. A new song, a new name. What a sweet, sweet time it'll be to see those that have gone before us. I remember when I first got saved, I was younger, and people used to talk about, you know, seeing their loved ones, and most of my loved ones were still on this side. But as you begin to get older, you start to see them depart. And what a reunion that will be. What a sweet time uh, Beulah Lamb will be. Yeah, amen, without a doubt. Well, take your Bibles, if you would. We're in the book of Revelation. And Revelation always gets everybody a little excited because it is the uncovering of the future. And we all love to know what's going to happen in the future. And uh, we've been studying, if you've been here uh, the last few weeks, we've been looking at the seven churches uh, of Asia. And we've been noticing as our study has begun to unfold that uh, we're, we're seeing tendencies in each one of those churches and we're realizing that those same tendencies are in every local assembly, even today. Those seeds, we find them in the church. And, and, and Jesus is pointing out those so that we can learn them, so that when we see them in ourselves or in the church, we can get rid of them. We can say, hey, we don't need that in our garden. It's not helping. It's, it's actually sowing weeds among the wheat and it's choking the very life and the existence of the church and we learned in Ephesus that they lost, they left their first love and then we learned in the next church that they were allowing worldliness into the church and then we learned in our our our, our next church and I'm losing my my thought there of of what that was oh they had the spirit of Jezebel in the church and then we had the one church uh, Smyrna that was persecuted and God didn't find anything wrong with that it was being purified just by the persecution now today we'll look at the church of Sardis and we'll learn about that church as we move towards Philadelphia the church of Philadelphia and then the church of Laodicea so open up your Bibles if you would to Revelation uh, chapter number two and uh, as we have done 
We've, uh, we've gone to our chapter 3, rather, uh, starting in verse number 1, chapter 3, but we have been reading the last verse of that narrative because we found that this verse is in every one of the descriptions of the churches at the very end. So if we look at verse number 6 of chapter number 3, we'll read there first, and then we'll go back to verse number 1. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So he's saying the church is a collective called out body, but we are the church. So he's speaking to each one of us individually here. We're not looking at the church as a whole in a sense, but each individual. And are these seeds in your life? Are these seeds also in the collective body as well? Now let's start at verse number one. He says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things say he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore there shall, shall not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou has a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that have, a, he that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches." Father, thank you now as we uh, turn our minds and our heart from singing and worshiping and, and praying and uh, fellowship, all these things so critical, so important to the local church. We now turn our hearts and mind towards the scriptures. And we ask, Lord, that you would um, open our minds, open our ears, that we would hear what you have to say and that we would be changed. Uh, may we examine our own selves. May the Holy Spirit point out areas of our life that are not in conformity with you. We also pray that those that are here today that do not know you, they've never been born again, they, they are not sure where they would spend eternity if they were to die today or tomorrow or 30 years from now. We pray that they'll come to Christ as well. So thank you for the scriptures. They are certainly um, our hope. We pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, I don't know what you think about when you think about a death or something dead uh, or something that's just wearing old. It's just a fact of life that uh, things get old and they wear apart, even if it's mechanical or uh, even on the human body. We're, we're all experiencing, as we get older, the effects of life. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter number 8, verses 22 and 23, it says, For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Even the very earth is falling apart. It's sin cursed. And God one day will create a new heaven and a new earth. But right now the earth itself is groaning. It's, it's struggling. It, it's dying. It's not what God intended at creation, but sin entered in and, and so it is cursed. But then it goes on in verse number three, uh, 23 and goes a little further and says, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our bodies. We're looking forward to that day when mortality is laid aside for immortality, where there's no more infirmities of the body. Throw the glasses out. Take off the knee braces. Uh, get rid of the gray hair. It's all uh, going to be something in the past. If you're the youngest guys here, you're saying, what in the world are you talking about? But for those of us that have experienced a little bit of life, we know how difficult it is to do a jumping jack anymore. And so we, we groan for that redemptive body one day. So the true church is one where Christ is acknowledged as its head. 
But Sardis was not acknowledging Christ as their head anymore. In fact, he goes on to say very clearly and clear, very um, plainly, which we'll see soon, is that the church was all but dead. Now, we know that there's scriptures that say that the gates of hell will never prevail against the church, but that doesn't mean that there are churches that die where Christ moves out of them and they're nothing but a place to gather and meet for social activities. And that is what Sardis' struggle was. So the true church is always one where Christ is acknowledged as its head. The Bible is preached and taught. The way of salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone, through his death, his burial, and his bodily resurrection. The Holy Spirit is obeyed in the leadership and the people, and the Great Commission is carried out. That is a living, alive church. Churches that don't have these characteristics are dead already because they do not have the Holy Spirit at work in the members through faith in Jesus Christ. There are many such churches today, both small and large. Where are, sorry to say, just social clubs? We have those same seeds in this church. We could easily be one year from now nothing more than a social club. We could ask Jesus Christ to leave our church and they have no part of it. We wouldn't say that, but our actions would cause him to have to leave and raise up a new work. The true Christ is not honored there. And although there may be a lot of form, there's no substance or power. The supernatural has been sapped from the fellowship. In some instances, Churches once preached the gospel of Christ, but then at times went on, they no longer did so. They started off in the right direction. The planting of the church was correct, but they somewhere along the, the walk, they, they lost that Christ is the head of the church. Of course, this is so sad. They have become dead churches as well. This is where we find ourselves today as we look at the church of Sardis. It's a feeble church at best. I don't know what you think of the word when you think feeble. When I was younger, I would use that word more often, but the older I get, I don't like it as much. But what it means is that it's struggling. It doesn't have the energy that it used to have. And these seeds are found in every church. And so Jesus' messages to the seven churches is don't allow these seeds of apostasy to grow in your life or in the life of the church. So for us to walk through this passage and to understand it clearly and to take a look at our own life and take a look at our church, we're going to have three points that will help us guide us through it. The first one is the feeble church in Sardis. The feeble church in Sardis. And the second point is the fast. And I have that in quotations because we're going to use the word that the Bible uses there. The fast church in Sardis. And then the last point will be the fruitful church church in Sardis, the fruitful church in Sardis. So let's look at our text together. The feeble church in Sardis. Well, Sardis was about 30 miles southeast of Thyatira that we learned about last week. So if you were a mailman and you were carrying the seven letters to the churches of Asia, that would be the next church would be Sardis on the circuit. Some centuries before Christ, this was a center location for trade and traffic. It was a booming city. It was reached in its zenith of glory about 500 B.C. It was known at that time as the impregnable city of the Queen of Asia. The way it was located, the way the hills were, it was a city that would not be easily taken. Picture this in your mind if we want to try to relate to something that would be more in our day and age, would be Switzerland. With its Alps and its surrounding, it's become a neutral country because it's very hard to attack. It's not easy. I'm sure today with the type of missiles we have and aircraft we have, it is not the same, but for back in the day for someone to climb those Alps and bring all their equipment and all their supplies, it was almost impossible to penetrate um, this city, Sardis, as well as Switzerland. So Sardis was surrounded by mountains, but sadly it was captured by Cyrus in 549 B.C. and later was conquered by Alexander the Great in um, 218 B.C. Twice this city, who was considered impregnable, was defeated, and it was defeated by its own fault. 
Now, it's one thing to be defeated. Like I used to say when I coached, if we got done with a game and we lost, but we played the best that we could, I said, hey, we did all we can. We just have to get better. But we, we laid it all out. Nobody was... But you know what? If you lose because of errors, you lose because your game's not in the head, you lose because you didn't show up, you lose because there was no effort in practice, well then, uh, shame on you. And twice this city um, was defeated because it did not have sentries on duty. They were sleeping. They were confident. They didn't believe they could be attacked. Boy, is that not dangerous in your own personal life? as well as in the life of the church, to think that we are untouchable. And so they had extreme confidence, the wrong kind of confidence. They fell asleep. We will find, in like manner, this church fell asleep as well as the country. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 13, Hold fast the form of sound words, which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. We are to hold fast. We are to keep sound doctrine. Now, by the time John wrote this letter, as Christ gave him the words, Sardis had reinvented itself and was becoming strong again. That happens, doesn't it? Countries come, countries go. Sometimes they're world powers. Other times they seem to be falling apart. But Sardis was starting to recover Sardis also faced a devastating earthquake and it really hurt it and was laying it in ruins. But the emperor Tiberius came along and rebuilt the city and Sardis began to life again and uh, of her own former self. And once again, she began to come overconfident. The spirit of self-confidence permeated the church as well. You know, a church can be impacted by the community it serves if it's not careful. We can be planted in an area God has supernaturally and on purpose and for an express reason has planted Faithway Baptist Church on the corner of Elm and Washington to be separate from the community, but yet in the community. If we become as the community, we're really going to lose our mornings and our effectiveness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what happened here in Sardis. They were, they were uh, undistinguishable from everything else that was taking place in that community. So that spirit of self-confidence can impact. The church of Sardis was rather sound and orthodox, but they had a fly in the ointment. There was something that was ruining the apocryphy. There was something that was ruining or spoiling uh, what was taking place there. There was some death. And flies, they say, can smell a dead corpse a mile and a half away, a little fly, is that sensitive to the smell of death that when something is dying or something is rotting, they can get to it from a mile and a half away. And that's what was taking uh, here was that there was a fly in the ointment. The church at Sardis was dying. The problem was the church was seen by the unsaved community as respectable. Hey, that's a respectable group of people. You know, they come and they're harmless, they, they come, they gather, they have their fellowships together, they go home, uh, boy, they take care of the lawn, they water the flowers, uh, you know, what a, what a nice, the lawn's always mowed, isn't, isn't that nice? But they were neither dangerous nor desirable, and the church ought to be a weapon in the hand of a living God. Not, a, not, not in an not in unfriendly way, but in a way that shows Christ high and lifted up. But they were neutral. They had no witness in the community. There was no risen Christ. Jesus said the church was dying. I'm not telling you the church was dying. Jesus said the church is dying. You can't get around that. It's not my... Uh, look at the church and the times and studying history and knowing my great 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 grandpa. I have his notes from the days of Sardis. Jesus Christ said the church was dying. In Revelation chapter 3, verse number 1, he said, Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works. Thou, and that thou has a name that thou livest and are dead. In other words, the community knows you. There's a church there. There's churches all over that dot the landscape of America still. 
but are, do they have Christ as the head of their church? The church of Sardis went from being alive to becoming a monument. Nothing but dead bones. All the church's man-made programs can never bring spiritual life to a church. It's Christ. He brings life to the church. Yes, we have programs. Of course we do. How are we going to fellowship if we don't do something together? But programs don't bring spirituality to the church. Programs are a result of the philosophy of the church that Christ is the chief shepherd. All churches are born and come alive when the Spirit of God is in charge. When Christ is in charge, the church is alive. May I say here, anything that you've seen at Faithway Baptist Church over this last year or two, the miracles we've seen of people coming here and now have trusted Christ as their Savior, ready to be baptized, those that have come here and linked arms with us, has been the work of God alone. Without Him, we would not have them. But God has brought them. God is doing the work. God, all the glory goes to Him. It isn't us. I'm glad he's using us, but it is him. Jesus says, I know thy works, that thou has a name, and thou livest, but you're dead. The problem with Sardis was living out of its own reputation, but inside Sardis was a spiritual graveyard. Jesus has to rebuke this church. He says in verse number 2 of Revelation chapter number 3, he says, Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Jesus says, be watchful. Wake up. It's dying all around you and you don't see it. Yes, you're busy. Yes, there's programs. Yes, there's doctrine. But I'm not there. There's no life. There's no spirit. There's no power. Do you not see it? In Romans... Chapter 13, verses 11 and 12, the scriptures say, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. That's a stupor, a slumber. For now is our salvation nearer than we ever believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. It's time to get busy is what, what is being said here. Paul is not only saying that to us, but he's saying to every church. Wake up. Put me back on the throne. Repent. Get that right. I am the reason why there is something happening. I am the reason why lives are being changed. I am the reason why people are coming to faith. And Jesus Christ says the same thing to the church of Sardis. Wake up. Do you not see that you're dying? There's flies in your ointment. Here was the characteristics of a dying church. We find it here. It will shift its priorities for sure, but in the text it says, for I have not found thy works perfect before me. Well, what does that mean, before God? Here was a seed found in the church that's in every church and affects every church, and we need to weed it out, make sure it does not permeate this church by God's grace. The seed found in this church was affecting the church. He says, I have not found thy works, he said, perfect before me or before God. The word in the Greek perfect in most cases that we study, because I've probably mentioned this a hundred times, is that when we find perfect in the epistles, it's talking about maturity. So when we see perfect, we say, oh, that we would grow to be perfect. Well, we're never going to be perfect, but we ought to be growing to maturity. But in this case, this word here, perfect in the Greek, has a different meaning, so we don't want to Talk, that he's talking about maturity here. The word, the word in the Greek perfect in this case is not talking about maturity. It means full or fulfilled. The church was empty. It was empty. Here's the word picture. It's like finding a beautiful shell on the beach, but when I look inside it expecting to find something living, something to eat, it's found empty. Looks great. I know that um, in Sarasota, Florida... They have wonderful shells. They have those big conch shells, you know. You know those little ones that you see? They're fun to collect, but, you know, who cares? You know, they're all broken, they're little things. But, but I remember my mom had gone there a couple times, and she brought back those really big ones. She goes, look, you, you put it to your ear, you can hear the ocean, you know, and you're 
nine years old, you say, wow, the ocean, you know. Oh, I hope I don't get wet. And, uh, and, uh, but in there, what they do is they, 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 they clear it all out. They, they, they clean it out so that you can have it as a trophy, maybe on your stand. That's where, where ours was in our house. But Jesus says, you're just like that. Sardis, you're beautiful. The colors of your shell are gorgeous. The community thinks you're upright. But when I look inside you, you're empty. You've kicked me out. Jesus says you have a good reputation, but there's nothing in you. There's no substance. The living part of the shell is missing. Only the external beauty is there. That is what you are like, Sardis. You're empty. What a tragedy. This church is, is only living in the presence of the people in the community. They're people pleasers. But it had no impact on the people. People weren't being saved. People weren't being challenged. Sin was not being called out. They had no influence in the community. They should have been living Coram Deo. You say, well, what is that? Well, it's a word that I read, so I looked it up, and it fits in perfectly to our message here, which means to live one's entire life in the presence of God. That's what we're to be. Under the authority of God, to the glory of God, to live in the presence of God is to understand that whatever we are doing and wherever we are doing it, we are acting under the gaze of God. Church of Sardis forgot that. They were busy. They taught doctrine, but there was no substance. The Spirit was not driving them. There was no, they were not living anymore. It was all a sham. It was all a show. God is omnipresent. There is no place so remote that we can escape his penetrating gaze. To live all quorum Deo. So when you go home today, say to the family, quorum Deo. Call all your friends and say, we need to live quorum Deo. It's to live a life of integrity. It is a life of wholesome that finds its unity and coherency in the majesty of God. A fragmented life is a life of disillusion. It is marked by inconsistency, disharmony, confusion, conflict, contradiction, and chaos. And that's what the church was. Yet they were operating. I don't want to come here, and neither do you, if Christ is not our chief shepherd. Why would we come here to hear each other pontificate how much we know? Why do we want to come here and just have programs to have programs upon programs if it isn't to drive people to the truth of who Jesus Christ is? What would be the sense of that? In Exodus chapter 33, a high and holy passage in there, we find Moses ready to go to the promised land and finds out because of the rebellion that an angel is going to go with them. And Moses says, what? I don't want an angel to go with me. God, if you're not going, I don't want to go. You know what? I don't want to come to church if God's not here. I don't want to, I don't want to be here if, God, if Jesus Christ is not the chief shepherd of our church. If God's not in what we're going to do next week, then let's not do it. And bring a bunch of kids in here and march them in here to, to yell and scream and get a balloon animal. Let's have them yell and scream and get a balloon animal and who Christ is and their need for salvation. I don't want to have the fire department come and hose us all down and get soaking wet and say how much fun it was to get full of baby shampoo and uh, smell that way and yell and scream if we're not going to teach the kids that there is a God and that they're responsible and in a loving and caring way we, pre we preach Christ risen, crucified, buried. I don't want to do it. What a, what a waste of time it is. The Three Stooges are on it this time. Why would we want to do that? And that's what was happening there. Jesus says to Sardis, you are going through the motions of Christianity. You gather for prayer. You're coming to church. You have a reputation in the community, but something was missing. The spiritual breath was not there. The living substance of spiritual life, the meaning was gone. The oil of the Holy Spirit was not presence. The real kernel of spiritual communion was missing. 
vital union with God through Jesus Christ was not there anymore. They were all talk and no action. Do we have those seeds? Do you have some of those seeds? Get rid of them. Root them out. They were people looking for programs. Do you remember JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, when he made that inaugural speech where he says, don't ask what um, you can do, don't ask what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. I mean, that's just a quote that's going to transcend time. People probably have used that over and over again. But this church Sardis, they wanted to know what the church could provide for them. Hey, what do you have for me? Hey, if your pews aren't comfortable, I ain't coming. Hey, listen, listen, if we don't have a coffee bar, I ain't coming. It, 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 you know, if you're not doing this and you're not doing this, uh, we're not coming. And that's not the church. The church has come and said, God, what would you have me to do? God, how can I fit into the church? God, what do I need to change? God, where am I deficient? God, how can I help be part of this movement that you're doing here in this community? How can I be an answer of who Christ is? That is what is to be, is to be our mindset. The church had spoiled their white garments. Now, we have a washer that's getting pretty old at our house. And my wife has noticed lately that the white towels are coming out dirtier than they went in. <laughs> in fact, she says, sometimes I just grab the towel and I'll throw it in there. And um, I won't, like, unfold it, you know, because you figure the agitator. Some of us are agitators. We know what that means. <laughs> We're agitators. We think the agitator would break it apart, but she goes, I can pull them out and they're still folded. <laughs> Save some time, but... It doesn't do the purpose, and we're noticing some dark marks on them. It, it, it's no good. The, the white garments are soiled. And Jesus says, your white garments are soiled. Your purity, your, your love for me is becoming soiled, and it's creeping into the church, and the church is dying. He's saying that to Sardis. I can't judge every church out there. I'm not going to go through a list of churches here and say, oh, that church is dead. Oh, and we're alive. I can only speak for Faithway Baptist Church and ask us, are our garments spoiled? Are we showing the signs of dying? Or is there seeds that have gotten into our church that need to be purged out so that we once again put Christ as the chief shepherd? That's our prayer. That's the only thing that we can affect today. We can't list churches in our mind. We're not there. We don't know their heart. We don't know the people. We don't know if they're the real deal or not. We don't know that. We can't drive by and say, oh, they're heathens. We don't know that. But we can tell in our church, the deadness will kill any church. The church can be orthodox. We can have a name and a reputation in this community. But Jesus says, are you alive in your communion with me? Is there spiritual vitality? Is your relationship just a shell? Is your relationship a sham? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords comes this morning to open your shell to see if there's anything in it. Is there anything in there? Is there breathing, groaning in you? Is there substance going out from you and coming into you? Are you growing in Christ's likeness? I don't know if any of you know much about shells, but to try to get that critter out of there is hard. You know, you try to cut it out and you try to get it out of there. It takes a lot of work to get it out. They fight. They fight for that, for, for their life in there. There's living life in there, and they're fighting. Hey, when Satan comes knocking and tells us that Jesus Christ doesn't need to be the chief shepherd, we ought to be fighting against that. We ought to be saying, yes, he should. Why? Because the scriptures say so. But life was gone. The problem with this church is they were playing a game with their walk with Christ. They were hypocrites, just like the Pharisees were. They worked hard to keep the outer cup clean and polished. They looked good. Pharisees always looked good. I mean, people respected them. People were in awe when the Pharisees came walking in. They didn't say, oh, look at that hypocrite. Jesus pointed out their hip hypocrisy, but people didn't. They said, look at, man, they tithe, they give, they pray. Look, they're always praying. They fast. 
I mean, they, they're, they're our teachers. But Jesus said they were hypocrites. They were actors like you see on the stage. They were playing a role. Playing the role of holiness. But holiness was nowhere in their mindset. The church of Sardis had a pretend religion. And Jesus was pointing it out. Is that us? Is that you? We might be hypocritical at times, aren't we? We're hypocritical at times. But we, we are not to be hypocrites. There's a big difference. There are times we say things that we ought not to say. There's times we think something about someone that we ought not to. But that's not our everyday practice to be a hypocrite. We just realize at times we're a little hypocritical. We find what's wrong instead of what's right. Or we just, someone bugs us and so they get underneath our skin. And so we let them know with a comment or something like that. But that's not our normal way. Jesus says to this church, that's your normal way. Wake up out of your slumber. And then point number two is the fast church in Sardis. Fast meaning um, in, in the scriptures, Revelation 3.3. 3, Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. The word fast means to guard from loss or injury. Hold fast. Don't lose what God's given us. Don't, don't, let's not lose the burden that we have for our community. Let's not lose our love for one another when each one of us are going through very difficult times and our body's hurting or we can't get out of the house or, or we're just emotionally wrought to the end. This ought to be a loving place where we're accepting that and helping them and praying with them and, and helping them get through the trial they're going through or whatever God is doing in their life. So how do we, how do we um, remain a living church? Well, Jesus says, remember. In our text, the first words, remember. Jesus says, take time to sit down and remember the events that led up your, to your conversion to Christ. The freshness of being saved. The, the knowing that your sin's forgiven and that you have a home in eternity. Every conversion is a miracle. Your story is unique. And unusual, and you should remember all the circumstances that led up to your conversion to Christ and how you caused you now to give yourself completely to Christ. Remember that. Don't forget those moments. Uh, re remember them. Uh, how beautiful that was to give everything to the Lord. It is always well for a Christian to call to remembrance the day that they were born again. See, if you can't remember, I'm not saying that you have to know the date, the time, and all that, but if you can't remember, it'd be like some going up to a married couple, they've been married 35 years, and you say, um, are you married? Well, I think I am. I think I remember something where something was said. It said something like, um, um, I, 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 yeah, do, do, I do, and I will. But I, I think it happened. Most likely it happened. That would be absolutely ridiculous. And for you not to know the day that you met Christ, whether you know the date, the time, or not, is not important here. Is that you can't remember when you realize that you were a sinner condemned because of your sin, and you realize that there was no other hope except the work on the cross of Jesus Christ, who died in your place, bearing your sins, who died for you, was buried and rose again, and your faith and dependence must be on Him alone. And his imputed righteousness is given to you and you have eternal life. How, how could you forget that? It's a monumental moment. It'd be like me coming to church today and saying, sorry, I was late. I had a flat tire and when I was loosening one of the lug nuts, it rolled off away from the tire and when I ran out into the street to get it, a 25,000 ton truck hit me and it threw me into the ditch. It took me a little while to get here. You'd say, What? Nobody gets hit by a 25,000 pound ton truck and is alive to even say it. You can't be saved and not know it. Because when Christ moves in, everything changes. There's no way you can say, oh, I think I met him. I, I might know him. No, if you met him, then everything is changing. Because that's how powerful he is. And it would be absolutely ridiculous to get saved and be able to live the same life. It just doesn't, it, it flies in the face of any logic. There's no logic there. So he says, and then he says, and heard how you used to get excited when the scriptures were told. 
the earnest and the attention you gave to the scriptures. Jesus says, remember that. Remember and hold fast. Hold fast the truth which you receive. Go back to them. Recommit them. Hold fast what remains of true biblical teaching. And then, of course, last he says, repent. Have a change of mind. Realize that, yes, I am born again. I do know Jesus. I am saved. I am confident of that. But somewhere along the line, I got my eyes off the cross and I'm living my own life. Oh, my goodness. My eyes off the cross. And let the light come back on by repenting, by coming into agreement with God that you're wrong and He's right. And say, you know what? I just got crossed up. Have you ever got crossed up? I have. Ever have a bad day? Listen, if you're married, you'll know if you had a bad day. Your wife will remind you you're having a bad day. Before I say anything, my wife will say, what's wrong? Why well, don't you say anything yet? <laughs> well, you just did now. Repent in regards to all which have departed from your view and get that right with him. The purity of the church is needed to have the power of God. If Christ be removed from the church, it loses its vision, it loses its power, it loses its source to carry out the mission of making and maturing disciples. It won't happen. Jesus said the prescription is to remember and to repent. Two R's. R and R. Remember and repent. Remember and repent. If you reject his admonitions, the natural result will be what happened at the church of Sardis. They died. They died. They were dead. There was no life in them. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon this. This is not talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is a warning to that church at Sardis that if you continue down this path out of my love for you, I will put you on the shelf until you do repent. Because for you to send a double message into the community is going to hurt people. And so Jesus says the Sardis church would, would, would bring upon themselves the removal of the effectiveness of the church. The phrase, I will come uh, on thee as a thief, is not the second coming, but with undealt sin that needed to be dealt with. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, verses 5, where we looked at the church of Ephesus, he said the same thing to Ephesus about them leaving their first love. He said, Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of thy place, except thou repent. He's saying the same thing here. He's just using the different words. He says the same thing in, in Revelation 2.16 to Pergamos. He says, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. So it's saying the same thing. It's just saying, listen, the natural, uh, course, uh, the, the natural uh, uh, reaping of sin is a departure of the Lord. Not that you're unsaved, not that you lose your salvation, but God says, I'm not going to work in, in, in a church where I am not the chief under shepherd just as a thief is known to take away secret secretly our property what has been given to us so christ would come suddenly all of a sudden the church would seem to be okay and the next thing you know it might be rich it might have a lot of money it might have givers the building might be gorgeous it might be three blocks long it might have 40 buses it might have uh, just uh, beautiful uh, pianos, everything. But he's not talking about that. He's saying it's not your chairs and your tables I'm going to take away or I'm going to knock your building down. He says, I'll remove myself. What would that be like if Christ wasn't here? The church would exist externally, but the inside of a shell, it would be empty and dead. Spiritually be the cause and the head would be cut off. And the body's no good without the head. Who's the head? Christ is the head. He must be the head of the church. It is Christ that gives light to the church, not us. If he would remove the lamp and leave the, the place in darkness is what he's saying. The expression is equivalent to saying that the church, there would cease to exist without Christ as the head. The church would go on. There are many churches today that go on, but you can't find the gospel there. There's no hope. And then our last point, which is very short, is number three, is the fruitful church in Sardis. Let's look at our text together. 
in Revelation chapter 3, verse number 4 says, Thou has a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled, defiled their garments. So there's always a remnant. There's a remnant here. There's a remnant everywhere. I hope our remnant is large. I hope that as you look at your life and the Holy Spirit talks to you, that maybe he'll point some things out and say, hey, you know what? A few of these seeds are growing. You've lost your first love or you're starting to. You're a little bit more worldly now. You're this or you're that. You have the spirit of Jezebel. Or maybe there's some deadness in you. Don't get those things right. But God says, wait a minute. There is a remnant. There are some things that are happening there and he says and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy this walking with jesus in white was first of all that they were doing the here and the now by the grace of god in other words they didn't fall asleep either and then one day they'll walk in white with god because they're saved but they're saying that they're walking by grace even now even though the church is dead there is some heartbeat with some people in the midst of a dying church. But also, it is a future tense. It will happen in eternity as well. We'll walk with God in white. John Gill, a theologian, said this, in walking in Christ by faith, and walking before Him as in, is in His sight, and walking worthy of Him in all well-pleasing in His ways and ordinances, and here a walking with Him in ways of special comfort and communion, both here and the hereafter. And this is in white, in white raiment, meaning either in the robes of his own righteousness compared to the fine linen and white, or in the shining robes of immortality and glory. He's saying that even here, God gives us the robes of the promise of immortality. We don't want to stain them or cast our pearls before the swine. But one day we'll walk with him in heaven in immortality where our clothes will never be soiled. But now we have to be watchful. And Sardis, just like the city lost twice where they should not have lost, they let down their guard. The church can let down their guard as well. So walk in white is a symbol of justification. That we can have the imputed righteousness of Christ that our robes for his robes, um, our righteousness for his righteousness, so that we can be born again. Uh, walking in white is also a symbol of sanctification unto holiness, the process of changing into Christ's likeness. Walk in white is a symbol of the joy we understand in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 7. Go thy way, eat thy bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart, for God now accepteth thy works. Walk in wise a symbol of heaven. Revelation chapter 3 verse 5, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. What a glory that when we arrive there one day, we are known of him. It's not if you know God, it's if he knows you. So walk with Jesus in white is to walk out of the merits of the one who is justified. One made holy, one made joyous in our Savior. We can now walk in white, even here on earth, as we travel to the celestial city, Beulah Land. And last, walk with Christ. Enoch walked with God. Do you remember Enoch in the Old Testament? He walked with God. It means to orient your life. Uh, uh, holy with him be at the hip with with the lord whatever wherever jesus is whatever jesus is doing find yourself there it's a mean it means you find your greatest delight to fellowship with your savior that's your top priority every day you desire to know him more he is always your chief desire it means to have a holy uh, uh, resolute to follow christ in his ways to be dedicated unto him and then walk worthy with Christ. Christ sees his, his own work through you, through his graces, and they are worthy. As we walk with Christ and other people see that walk, and they say, wait a minute, why are you so different? All this is going on in our world and stuff like that. You seem to have some type of peace that I don't have. Uh, you're going through the same thing I am. 
Uh, you could die of cancer. I could die of cancer. The unsafe can die of cancer. We all go through very troubling times in our life. All of us do. We, we all face the same situation, unsaved and saved. But why is it that the way you handle the circumstances and the way you hold your emotions together are so much different than mine? Why is that? Because of my walk with Christ. Because he has justified me. Because I know that this life is going to bring those circumstances. But I know who I'm trusted in and I know he is able to get me through it even if it's unto death. I know that I'll be with him one day in spotless white robe. I am invited to the wedding. I am a guest. I do not have to sneak in. I do not try to get in. My robes are being worn for all to see. And a person will say, that's what I'm looking for. I am looking for peace. I am looking for something that I cannot find in and of myself. I, can't, I can have moments of happiness, but I can't have everlasting joy anymore. But God can bring that joy even in the terrible situations that you're facing. I bet everybody here, if they were honest, could raise their hand and say, there is some emotion going on in my life. There is some difficulties going on in my life. And you can raise your hand and say, there is some great joy in my life as well. They're both there. And God carries us through all those areas. And then other people see that. And they see the difference. So our heart ought to be, I want to walk with you. I want more orthodoxy. In Sardis, there was a remnant. Today, there's a remnant. There's a remnant in America. There's a remnant. God's always going to have a remnant. You have a choice to be part of that remnant. You see, you can come here and come here for the next 20 years and never get saved. And you'll be here in this church sitting in a pew, uh, participating in everything. But God says a real remnant is one that's born again and is being changed by the power of the Spirit to be more Christ-like every moment to be a faithful remnant we need to examine ourselves and see if we would have any of these seeds of any of the seven churches if so we need to root those out and replace them with the good seed of christ he ends with this plead he ends this with all of the pleads aren't you glad for free will i don't think anybody in here says i wish i didn't have any free will and that um god programmed me and he programmed me so much that I can't but love him because I, I, he just programmed me. I, I, I can't think for myself. All of it's done for me. I, I, I know God gives you complete free will to choose to follow him, to choose to get right, to choose to be his disciple. He gives you that free will. What a wonderful, loving God. Boy, the last thing I want to do is, is someone get paid to come into my house every day and heap accolations on, upon me or accolades on me all day. Oh, you're so wonderful. Oh, you're so... All right, here's your 20 bucks. Go. And, and hear that all day. You want someone that legitimately loves you, someone that legitimately wants to be with you, someone that sees in you. And that's what God says. You have that choice today. He says this. He ends it in 3.6. Um, uh, that's chapter 4. In chapter 3, verse 6, he says, He that have an ear. See, the ears of a Christian hear differently than the unsaved. Because we're going to hear the trumpet. The unsaved aren't. We have different eyes. We have different ears. So you have a different ear if you're born again. So he says, He that have an ear. So he says, Those of you that are saved, you can hear what I'm going to say now. Other people can't. If you're unsaved, this is falling on deaf ears. It doesn't make sense. It's a bunch of blah, 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 blah. When's it going to end? He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You have the Holy Spirit that indwells you and has sealed you. He is the earnest down payment, and he has sealed you. So the Spirit jumps in you, just like John jumped uh, when he heard that uh, Mary was pregnant, he knew it was the Messiah. He jumped. The Spirit had him leap with joy. And so we leap with joy saying, yes, I hear. Help me in these areas of these seeds that I'm allowing into my life. Root them out because in my natural being, I, I'm prone to wander. I'm prone to have a Jezebelian spirit. I'm prone to leave my first love. I'm prone to allow worldliness into my life. I'm prone to be dead. And live my life the way I want. I'm prone to those. God, root those out. 
Get them out of my life. Don't allow them there because I want to be effective for you because I do love you. I believe you do. If you're a new creation, you love the Lord. I'm not doubting that you love Him. We just struggle with giving everything to Him. We just struggle giving consistency and faithfulness to Him. We just we fight it. We just fight it. But God says, listen, you can make a difference. You can get right with me. So if you have any of those seeds, get right. Uh, come and, and take care of those. And, and, and don't look for ceremonial cleansing today. Look for Calvary cleansing today. Look for the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what David said. David said, I want to be right with you, not because I bring some animal into the uh, temple and the high priest cuts it off and says to me, okay, you're okay now, you can go. I want to come and I want, I want cleansing. I want, I, want, I, want to be, I want to be scrubbed with hyssop. I want to come clean. Will you come clean today? Amen. Will you come clean today? We got a big week ahead of us. We got, we got an opportunity in front of us to reach our community. Let's get right. Let's get ready. Let's get ready. Remember that you have all the favor with God you can ever have. Remember, if you're born again, you have all the favor. So this isn't getting more favor with God. You have all the favor. Your sins are forgiven. Past, present, future. It's just how clean is your vessel right now. Sometimes a vessel needs to be clean. Every time that um, our windows get dirty, we don't tear the house down. Even though it's probably cheaper to tear your house down and rebuild it than get new windows. Do you ever get an estimate on new windows? It's like getting a third mortgage for those of you that have a second one already. And it's just incredible about how much they want for that. No, you just what? You get the right kind of fluid and you wash the windows down and you say, oh, I didn't realize they were so bright outside. You don't, that's what God's asking you to do today. Just wash your windows. You don't need to be saved again. If you're already saved, you're saved. It's just that some of the windows have gotten a little dirty. There's some seeds on there. There's some, something's been, something's been dirtying your windows. Get out the Windex. And make it happen. Get out the vinegar, whatever, the newspaper, whatever you need to do, and wash those windows. Get the corners. Get the corners. You know, we have a tendency to clean the middle, don't we? You ever see that? I always wonder. They have like a little circle there. They look out. Why don't they wash the whole thing? I don't get it. But wash the whole thing. Wash the whole thing. So here's the invitation. If you're unsaved, come. If you're unsaved, come. If you're saved, then what needs to be washed? I don't know. But the Holy Spirit never misses. So whatever you're thinking now, whatever's in your heart now, is the Holy Spirit pointing to it saying, ah, here it is. Here it is. You forgot about this one. Get it clean. Get it washed. Take care of it. We don't have our piano player today. And we normally sometimes have a piano player when we do our invitation. But we don't have to have that. Let the Holy Spirit string across the melodies of your heart and point out what needs to be taken care of. Would you do that? You can do it with your eyes open. You can close your eyes. You can come forward. You, whatever it is, take care of it now. Some people like to close their eyes to have privacy. Some people like to have their eyes open. Whatever it is, you do business with God. And if you're unsaved, you come so that we can show you how you can be born again. Let's take this moment right now.
Father, thank you. We could certainly sit here and contemplate a lot, and uh, we have homes today where we can get alone and, and search the scriptures and rehearse this message in our mind and, and think through it. And, uh, but Father, thank you for uh, pricking our hearts to rubbing us and showing us maybe some areas of our life that need to be adjusted. We pray that we would. We're so thankful for your goodness and your grace. Uh, right before we end, uh, Bob, would you come up here, please, Bob Throw? Thank you. Come on up here. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Okay. Unless there's two Bob Throws. <laughs> uh, I want him to come up here and close us in prayer. I just want to say Bob has been a constant encouragement to me. He does not come to our church here, and um, he told me that uh, for I don't know how many years he's been praying for yeah. a Bible-believing church in this area. So, yes, um, Bob Muckenschnabel came here and planted with good people. Yes, you were part of that call too, but it started in someone's heart in his bedroom probably or somewhere praying that this community would have a Bible-believing church in it to reach it. And um, when I'm out canvassing her out and I catch him on the street, uh, I think if, if I said I know his gift would be a gift of encouragement. Because whenever I leave him, I say, wow, everything's going to be okay. <laughs> you know, he's just such an encourager. So, and, and he comes every year and helps us. And i um, so thankful for that, your spirit and your heart. And just um, you want to say something that's fine and close us in prayer. Okay, please. Good morning, saints. And um, you're looking at a, a farm boy that's very broken, but it's been by the spirit of God. Uh, a farm boy that has... Uh, been touched by God so I can weep over the things he weeps about and um, he loves the minister life and that's only comes through Jesus and uh, I just want I just want to press on to know him more I want to press on to get more of Jesus as you do and I do thank God for uh, uh, Pastor Coons thank you for uh, ministering the Word of God didn't you just sense the Holy Spirit just washing us. You know, when I take a shower, I love to get clean, but the Holy Spirit washes us. David cried out, God, wash me from all sin. And that's what our hearts are too. Um, Jesus is coming soon. And he says in Revelation that he's coming back for a bride that's without spot, blemish, and wrinkle. So the sanctification, these trials that the Lord has, has been allowing you to go through is actually ordained by him to purify and cleanse you and me from all unrighteousness. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. And we have freedom today through the blood of Christ. We have victory today through the blood of Christ. And so I rejoice. Um, uh, and I love to bless you and just thank God for, for maybe, I don't know how many years we've been praying for revival and awakening in the church. The promise to that Sardis church, to him who overcomes, I will give. So there's more of Jesus, more of his life. And you know what? Just come to him as you are. It's all about him. It's not about you, but the Holy Spirit of God is washing you, cleansing you. And don't ever let that spirit of Jezebel and that strong spirit of condemnation come against you. Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And praise God for the communion table. Sometimes I have communion at, at home because I, I, I sin. And I said, Lord, I just want to get that washed right now, and I don't want to repeat it. Isn't it freeing when the Lord so sets you free and cleanses you from things that hold you back or that can bring bondage? But Jesus is greater in you, and the enemy is a liar. And when he comes, uh, just put on that whole armor of God as it says in Ephesians 6.10, just dress yourself in the beauty of his righteousness, which is his blood. And there's nothing more pure than the blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, as you look upon Hampshire and see all the people that don't know you, Jesus, I know you really weep. And, and you're looking for someone to stand in the gap and so, Father, thank you for raising up Faithway Baptist Church.
I pray that Faithway Baptist Church would be so filled with amazing grace, the sweetness of Jesus, the gentleness, the kindness of Jesus, uh, that would just permeate us as we spend time, Lord, reading your word. I love your word. Uh, Lord, I love how your Holy Spirit speaks to us um, when we read your word. And Lord, you quicken us when we, we read your word. And Lord, we lift up your word. It's you, it's you, Jesus. And we just lift up the word that as we read it this week and meditate upon the words we just heard today. I know where I need to repent today just from hearing this message. And I just thank you, Lord, that with outstretched hands, your hands are beckoning us to come to you. You're saying, come, come. There's nothing that you have done that I cannot wash. There's nothing that you have done that I cannot clean through my precious blood. I am almighty God. I love you. And I know how to clean you and refresh you. Oh, Father, thank you for this wonderful gift of eternal life. But until that day comes, Lord, we choose to, John 15, abide in you so that you will abide. We want to abide in you and bear much fruit. And Jesus, you shared how much joy this is that when we die to self daily, just die to self daily, our will, and choose your will, and to be clothed in the beauty of your Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, thank you for raising up this church. And Father, I pray that this light in the parade, we ask your blessing. Let our faces shine for Jesus, Lord. Oh, Lord, may Hampshire, may you take back Hampshire for your own. May you so minister um, Jesus to Hampshire. May their eyes be open. May their hearts be uh, convicted of of righteousness and in the sin that besets us from eternal life. Oh God, I just want to also thank you and encourage the saints today that there's just a time in our lives where we just want to be still and know that you are God, that Psalm 4610 moment. And that's what you've been doing in my life. And when I choose to do that, Lord, you always speak. And so, Father, speak to your children here. Speak to your sons and your daughters. And, Lord, build them up and strengthen them through the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray, Holy Spirit, come upon us more because we need you desperately. And, Lord, we thank you for the soon coming revival of our hearts and then the church as a whole. In Jesus' precious name, amen. 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 Okay, thank you. If I could have about two men uh, pull that table out of that room there, we need to bring up here if somebody wants to sign up for uh, uh, anything for vacation out of school. If I could just get Dave Dale and John, could you maybe help us bring inside that or got there and we're just going to pull that table right up here in front. Okay.